Welcome to Shoot the Breeze, a podcast that celebrates the messiness of life, relationships, and Christianity, featuring my wife Lacey and myself, Nathan. It's creatively titled because it will be just us shooting the breeze, uh, sometimes with guests, while occasionally saying something important. We hope you enjoy. Two groups of people you can't trust are lawyers, politicians, and bad accountants. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, uh, there, there was a kidnapping at school yesterday, and um, but don't worry though it, it's okay. He woke up. <laughs> I was waiting. I was wondering. Um, is it here? Okay. So especially with what we're going to be talking about, Scott, I think the question that has come to my mind. Is uh, I can't do it. I'm starting to laugh. He said, "You set up too long." I can't, I can't. <laughs> he took too long. Uh, <clears throat> is it is it ignorance or apathy that's destroying the world today? Honestly, uh, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm done. Um, oh, they've been with us. On the pre, <laughs> on the pre-show, pre-show, the pre-show. The pre-show. Yeah, that oh was. Uh, I think I'm tapped out. I can't. Um, I can't I'm, I'm still like giggling because. Of, okay, so just a. There's no way we can re redo the story, but here's the here's the. That I cried. Summary. I laughed so hard. Here's the spark. Here's the spark notes. There's a guy who looks like me, <laughs> at church. <laughs> Who I thought was me. <laughs> we thought a picture of the guy was Nate. I was like, I don't sit there. That why am I sitting there? I haven't sat there forever. Oh, it's cause it's not me. <laughs> That's the best part. Um, anyways, oh, there's yeah. just there's so much. Okay. okay, so we're just giggling about all the uh, how that how how all of that could have went down. Uh, <laughs> Focus, we're in a series dealing with uh, messy... Did I press record? I don't even know if I pressed... Hold on. Mm. Goodness. Okay. I'm all, I'm all flummoxed because of uh, how we started out. I know, fake I, uh, Nate. I know, <laughs> fake Nate. <laughs> Impos- no, we've been calling him Costco Nate because he's <clears throat> taller than me. and um, And so it's like, well... He's taller. He's it's more it's more, more of more, <laughs> more of Nate. So, um, all right. Let me first of all, we this is cultivate relationships. <laughs> this is like we're talking about rejection, and all and I can't not laugh. I just <laughs> right like such a terrible topic dealing with rejection and acceptance, and then and then come into mm. just giggling and, and laughter. Mirth. How dare you guys have mirth on such a? How dare you. All right. This is. Shoot the breeze, but this is the Bible School Edition, which is a series on our podcast, Shoot the Breeze, that explores scriptures, Christianity, and the church from a ministry leadership perspective. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> ministry leadership and pastoral perspective. Sorry, I'm just going back to I'm going back to your, your story that you told me about who you thought I was. <laughs> I thought Nate was walking up to me during worship to have a to share that he needed to share a word on stage, and so I. It's all the kids in front of us worshiping. So I just went to meet him there. So as I'm walking up right before I get to him, I realize he's, that's not Nate. <laughs> and then I'm like, how do I walk backwards really cool? Uh, and I thought the funniest thing was, you know, I was telling Nate, uh, my first thought when I saw him walking was, he has a word from the Lord. <laughs> like that. That was the very first thing that came out. He went, he has a word from the, he Lord. Has a word from the Lord. Come on stage with me. So, so yeah. Uh, and it, we're, in the, we're in, within this podcast, uh, Shoot the Breeze series, we're talking about messy Christianity um, and, and basically how Jesus is is okay with mess uh he's okay with what that looks like in our life always toward the goal obviously of of freedom and wholeness and discipleship it's not just mess for mess sake right um right we're it it is okay scott so this is interesting we've we've gotten accused of like lacy and i we've been in freedom ministry in general for a while um but but we've gotten accused of, well, you guys don't focus enough on sin. Yeah. You know? And here's the thing. We do. We just, like Jesus, cover over it to move on toward healthy, spirit-led. When you say cover over it, meaning 
So, do you remember um, bury it and don't ever deal with it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get over it. No, because that's what the thought is. It behind is behind the yeah. accusation, right? No, what it means is uh, who someone believes they are will determine what they believe they can do. Mm -hmm. um, kind of the idea being uh, the perception of one's identity leads to their activity. Right. And oftentimes in the church that I know I grew up in, um, oftentimes we want to change people's behavior rather than, hey, let's, let's maybe heal your perception, your distorted and devalued perception of mm -hmm. yourself um, <clears throat> before we talk about behavior. Because otherwise, right. honestly, otherwise all you're doing is moralistic religion. Right. You're not actually doing relationship. And I use the example of, let's say Lacey and I are in a massive fight. And I'm like, fine. I'm going to go buy her flowers because that's what you're supposed to do in a fight. Or I'm going to do the dishes like some kind of chore. Mm -hmm. Does that make our relationship right? No. no. I can do stuff that looks good, though. And that's just moralism. But it right. has nothing to do with how right. my relationship with is with her. Um, anyway, so that's, that's what, yeah. So they accuse us of not dealing with sin when in reality, I would argue, yeah, we deal with the underlying thing that leads to sin so that they don't have to sin anymore. Right. But we both know there's, there's, there's a, a sect of Christianity that just hammers sin, 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 sin. Um, <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's not that at all. Um, anyways, I don't know how I got on that. What was it? Rejection. Rejection. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's uh, like the big opening question that we mm -hmm. have. Uh, kind of that leads us, that will lead us through this whole whole teaching uh, or episode is, are there aspects of your past that still haunt you or make you feel inferior or superior to others? Oftentimes when we deal with a rejection... It's kind of this self-focused rejection, which is true. That's a huge thing that right. we'll, we'll cover for sure. But I think the element that's also missed, and I like this in um, Luke 15, the rebellious son versus the religious son. Right. They both had rejection in different ways. Mm -hmm. But how, how often does rejection... Oh, okay. Here, I'm curious. I tended to look at myself as more the the rebellious son because of my sins. How did you... You've talked about your story, mm -hmm. how you were the judgmental one. How would you fit rejection into that, into that part of it? Like I, I was saying here, the inferior versus superior. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it was... I was playing two roles or mm -hmm. living two lives in the midst of both being wrong. But like, so I'm rejected mm -hmm. and... Perceived rejection. So some is real and some isn't, but I don't right. find that out for right. 50 years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was a couple months ago. Uh, no. Um, so so I'm rebellious on one way, okay. but I'm better than everybody else because I'm doing every. I'm earning. So I live to earn things. I perform. Yeah. And in my mind, I'm like, yeah, I'm doing them right. So okay. I... I even if you don't give me what I <clears throat> am demanding or trying to earn, I, I earned it. Okay. But I'm also going to rebel against any authority. So it was a weird thing. Yeah. Because I was certainly the head scratching kid. Like I, you know, I, I bothered a lot of people. <laughs> but at the same time, I'm, you know, straight A's, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know. Yeah, you know, varsity uh, sports, straight A. So it's like you can't hold anything against me because I'm performing well. Right. So look how perfect I am. Right. But I'm also the biggest punk, and I'm gonna do everything possible. So it was a weird thing, and and I think mine. I think more the reality was more I was just a, re a rebel. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, just longing to be have somebody rescue me, <laughs> and nobody came for me. And so you. Had but I also didn't let them. So you know. Yeah. That's yeah. the weird thing. It's like, I want you to rescue me, but if you try, I'm going to run harder or just mock you for doing it. It was a weird, I mean, it's so diabolical. It's like, like the enemy is probably like, I don't even know if we have to try with this one. <laughs> like, he's, he's got, got this. He's got this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's a scheme of the enemy, obviously, to make us buy into rejection and then live out of something. Yeah. We see it all through scripture. But yeah, the, yeah, when I look at both, 
I'm like, I, I tried to be the older brother mm-hmm. and prove myself, but I was more like, just let me go. Just let me go. Right. So that kind of leads into what baggage are you continually dragging around that makes you feel like you're not accepted or loved, right? So mm-hmm. those two questions, what are there? Or and what, I think those are answered on the back page when we yeah, get yeah. there so well. Right. So you hold those. Right. But that's the, I think that's the mindset as we're walking through this, this yeah. episode. Those are the two questions. Are there aspects of your past that still haunt you? And then what baggage are you continually dragging around? Right. I remember having a evangelism course in Bible school where you had to go out on the streets and and basically preach to someone. <laughs> and I hated that. It was miserable. All spoiler alert, I got an F because I never did it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we had every in YWAM, Youth of the Mission, every Friday night was go to one of the t- big tourist towns and street evangelism for four hours. Oh. It used to kill me. I used to beg Jesus, find me somebody from Texas, something that I could just talk what I yeah. know, because yeah. I can't just walk up. If you die today, where would you go for have eternity? You, wait, wait, wait. Have, you, have you sinned? Or have you, have you stolen something? What does that make you? Have you told a lie? What does that... Have you ever looked at a woman lustfully? What does that make you in your heart? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm not a fan. Not a fan. So here's, no, yeah. <clears throat> so I think yeah, you and I have this have this thing though. We love talking to people and hearing story. Yeah, um, which I would argue, actually, the Greek word for evangelism is to share a story. Really? Yeah, that's actually that's oh, actually wow. so an evangelist huh. is a storyteller. It makes sense because that's what an evangelist is. <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, so. <clears throat> so that's where it, it was really funny, Scott. This was, I remember studying this on Mike Sloan's back porch. We were mm-hmm. staying at his cabin and I'm like this, this word evangelist. Cause someone said, someone had a prophetic word for me. They're like, Hey, you're a, you're an evangelist. I'm like, you're like, you stop you, that. You, you shut your <laughs> mouth. <laughs> you shut your dirty I'll mouth. I'll show you rebellion. And, but, I, but I trusted this person. I, I, I'm like, hmm. okay, God, uh, no, I'm not. <clears throat> and, and that's where I'm like, okay evangelism let's start 101 what's the bible word for it what's mm-hmm. the greek word for it and like it, it it says uh something to the effect of like proclaiming a a story or or someone who proclaims the story of what happened to them or something uh, mm. uh, you evangelize you witness you kind of an idea and i was like i am <laughs> and so, but is is that and so evangelism is telling our messy jesus story which john 4 is this the passage of the woman at the well. Such a good story. Okay, I have a question for you. I'm curious it's where a, you land. On it's something. amazing, though. I'll say this, because you, yeah. you mentioned today in the staff meeting when you were doing equipping, you see it so many... It's like <laughs> the classic diamond. It, it that, really is. Yeah. You see it in a different... You see a different aspect of it every time. Even yesterday, listening in, mm-hmm. in church, I was like, oh, wow. Oh. Oh, wow. The sermon yesterday... I'm, I'm linking it as a... As a uh, as a resource. You never leak mine. I'm very rejected. <laughs> you know what? You're confident in your identity. <laughs> no, it was, dude, yeah. dude, it was powerful. It was, it was good. so good. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how he didn't, he didn't cry when he read the Lakato book. I don't know. You and I would have been bawling. I was bawling. <laughs> Vinton, I turned and Vinton's crying. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so good. I'm not a, okay. It's, I'm not a Max Licato fan because I feel like he just writes a new book with the same content in it. His children mm. books, though. Oh, my word. He's such a good person, though, so man. Good. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. That's incredible why I love Incredible integrity. I, yeah. Incredible integrity. He was incredible, always so yeah. good to us in San Antonio as a church. Um, oh, yeah. Link. <laughs> Sorry. I'm writing myself a note for the, for the <laughs> description. Link uh, sermon. Okay. Um, it's the story of the woman at the well. Oh, and you said you said yeah, you wanted so I, to ask. I have, me a I have a question about that. Okay, I know what I believe. Do you think Jesus knew prior to that moment someone was going to be there? No, I think oh, he was okay. just led by the Spirit. Oh, okay, okay. I, I, I mean, they, they're, I mean. they're they're. I mean, he didn't worry about. I mean, they just they were thirsty and getting water. 
You know, okay. and and he probably I don't know if he'd ever been. He'd probably been to Jacob's Well. I don't know, maybe. I think he would. How far would he have grown up from it? But like, right. you know, it's a famous well, right? Um, the but, reason, but I, you know, he, he probably it was probably pretty cool, like going to some, you know, uh, <clears throat> famous place that you maybe grew up hearing about or right. going to a few times. But but I think the Holy Spirit just led him there, and then and the, I think the Holy Spirit told him what he told her. Okay, because he lived. Yeah, he like. Lived. You and I. He lived ready. He chose ready to, to, and he yeah. chose to go. I'm going to be led by the Spirit. There, okay. So there's some sermons that I've heard where Jesus knew he was coming to the well, and there was going to be a woman there, and he had this great revelation. Okay, this is going to sound bad. I don't think Jesus was that spiritual. Meaning, <laughs> what I mean is, if we take Jesus mysticism out of it, right? Jesus is just living life. He has a he has a mission. Mm-hmm. His one mission, right? It says he he turned his face to Jerusalem. He knew what he was. I don't mean he was like clueless, just like <laughs> yeah. What I mean is, I think he lived life and took took opportunity. So, um, chapter four, verse seven, no, verse uh, five, and he. Uh, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar uh, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his sons, Joseph and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus being wearied from his journey was sitting thus by the well. So I think period, he was right. tapped out and he goes, Hey, can you guys go get us some food? Cause he was with his other disciples. That to me sets this whole thing up. He's exhausted, hungry, and thirsty, right? That's the, the Jesus we come on to this scene with there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, right? Like nothing (laughs) again, nothing spiritual. Right. Right. And for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it you being a Jew? Ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman. So there's so much under that, right? Cause the parenthetical that John gives us is for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Yeah. And, and here's the thing, like, when she asked, like, if she had just said, okay. <laughs> but there are times, so many times throughout my week in my life, and somebody will, I'll just, you know, somebody I've never seen before, don't know, and all of a sudden a phrase is said, some response is made. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like, oh, this is a moment. This is it. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think the first time that really stood out, and we had a ministry in Alaska called Fresh Start, in the back, we had, I had a hoodie on. Mm-hmm. And uh, and it said it's never too late. That was kind of our phrase yeah. tag tagline thingy. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just standing in line at the grocery store, and I heard somebody say, "Yeah, well, it is for some of us." I you know I don't even know it. I'm just standing yeah. there. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was like, "Oh, that person's referring to me." And I turn around and realize what I have yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. And and I was like, and I knew this is the moment. And I said something to the effect of, "You've been hurt a lot." Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We went over to Kaladi. It was like two hours at Kaladi Brothers Dude. Coffee. But it was just that the Holy Spirit probably was like, Scott, yeah. you're wearing that shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. And that's why he's mad. Yeah. Because it's too late for him in his mind. He's hopeless. Yep. That's I mean, what I mean. And what a, what more of a powerful, powerful story and relatable story, that's why the Gospels were written, mm-hmm. is to show us, oh, I can do that. Right. I can look for it. I don't have to have this days in advance, this vision of a well and memorized laws. It's, it's the woman going, right. You could see there's a heart issue there. Why are you talking to me? You're not supposed to be talking to me. Yeah. And And if we live by the spirit, we're like, this is a moment. Yeah. Okay. I was just curious what your, your thought was on that. I never thought it in this way, that kind of, but yeah, it's perfect. And we can just slot ourselves right into that story and be that way. Because the question comes from her, not from him. Right. He's thirsty. Give me a drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was in line at Cars yeah. buying yeah. a salad or something. And Was it Cars or Eagle at the time? It was Cars in, in Wasilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Because Safeway down south where y'all were. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So it, John 4 is this the story of the Samaritan woman. And basically she she is the one that prompts it, right? The mm-hmm. huh, For some people it is. That, <laughs> that moment, right? Yeah. And Jesus goes, oh, I got this. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. um, our messy story. Oh, this is what happens. So, so she's at the well. She's asking Jesus questions. And by the spirit is fed, hey, you, you actually, you're right. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've not had... <laughs> 
five other husbands, <laughs> uh, or you've had five other husbands, and the one yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. And I love I love this line. From, <laughs> sorry, I love this line from the lady after Jesus gives specificity to her story. She goes, "Sir." I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> like, duh. <laughs> like, yeah. just the most duh thing. And I love this because I, I think this is both, one of two things are happening here. Or both things. I think it's a question to divert attention away from her personal life. And I think it's also a genuine question, knowing this rivalry between Jew and Gentile, or Jew and Samaritan. Mm -hmm. She goes... So where are we going to worship on this mountain or that mountain? And Jesus brings it all together. Her story, that theological right. question, that um, um, nationality question, <clears throat> right? Samaritan versus Jew. And just lumps it into, hey, it doesn't matter. If you're in the spirit, you can worship wherever you want. Period. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter if you're Samaritan. doesn't matter what you've done. Because right. that's not even the thing. Um, and so... The tagline that I have is uh, our messy story for John 4, 1 through 4, uh, 42, is our messy story leads people to experience Jesus for their own mess and, um, and then ultimately for them to experience him. So she shares, she goes back to Sicker, Sikar, I think it is, says, this guy told me everything I've ever done. And then they come and I like, they come to hear him. Right. And then I like at the end, they go, um... Let's see, at this point, the disciples came and they were amazed. Um, let's see here. Come see the man. Okay. They wanted to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, come, and the disciples were saying, okay, where is it? Oh, yeah, the verse 39. And from that city, many of the Samaritans believed him because of the word of the woman who testified. So they're like, ooh, I, okay, I believe him. I want to see what, who this is. He told me all the things that I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them and they stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word and they were staying with the woman. It is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard ourselves and know that this is the one indeed, the savior of the world. So the woman's story mm -hmm. caused them to believe. <clears throat> then they came and that gave them confidence to go, now yeah. I know. But here's the crazy thing. When you think of the woman's story, she's running back into mm -hmm. town. Mm -hmm. In essence, she's saying, Hey, I just met a guy who read my heart mail, mm -hmm. right? He he told me everything I did. Well, I, I mean, you take it for what it's worth in the moment. Like her salvation and transformation mm -hmm. story was minutes old. Yeah. And none of her life circumstances had changed. Right, right. So really the only thing the people saw was her willingness to tell her mess. To be vulnerable. Yeah, that was it. Because it. she wasn't floating. She had no halo. Yeah. She wasn't, uh, you know, reading time. the four spiritual laws, you know, to them. Yeah. I mean, nothing. The Romans Road hadn't even been, yeah, you like, know, written yet. So she couldn't do that. <laughs> like, she was new <laughs> because he made her new. But, she, but no one yeah. really knew that except for she's being really open and vulnerable right now. Right. And, right. and that prompted them to go... Hey, maybe we should go check this out. And I think that's so powerful because maybe even less like the demoniac, mm -hmm. there were some obvious changes that had happened when he walked in first. He's not naked. He's in his but right still, mind. But even that one, I was just going to. It was young. One. He was minutes. very young in minutes. But yeah. like she, I mean, what, what change had she had except for probably the joy. Yeah. It, her countenance and then the willingness to be real. Yeah. And they were like, huh, something here. And then later they're like, we believe for ourselves now. But I thought that was so cool because it wasn't like she went and spent a year back in town showing them I'm different. I, you know, I moved out from, you know, Billy's house because <laughs> we weren't married, you know, <laughs> whatever. Well, well nothing had changed. Here's the thing, though. Her I'm, clothes were still at the house. I'm wondering... So I, 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 I expect the town to go, <laughs> yeah, we, we know your story. And she's like, no, 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 guys, a Jew came. Hmm. Yeah. A Jew came and told me everything I'd ever done. Like, that's kind of how I'm, I'm seeing the story right. play out to where they're like, yeah, everyone knows your story. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're finally there. Huh? <laughs> exactly. But then she's like, no, 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 it was a Jew. And I bet you that's where they're like, wait, why would, why would a Jew know? Our, what's happening in our little corner of the world. 
Why? Mm-hmm. How? Interesting. Yeah. And then, and then kind of that progression of belief and faith. Yeah. Um, the other one that we, we really like is that Matthew 8, 8, 13. <laughs> um, it's found in several other uh, places. I think it's, let's see, Matthew 8, 28 through 34, Mark 5, Luke 8. Do you have a preference? Is there a, a passage you like better? Uh, I think I like, uh, I, I think it. The Matthew like, one says there's two guys. Right. I, yeah. I like the fact that there's two, but I, I think I like the way the story plays out in one of the other two, whether it just like can Luke. focus on the one. I like Luke. What is, is he, does he focus on the two or the one? Uh, it gives a ton of detail. That's why. That might be why. Oh, come on. Click it. There we go. Um, anyways, through that. So, again, you have a story of two guys, um, and I would say one featured probably more prominently, like the spokesperson, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it's like with the, the disciples, it says, and the disciples in Acts 2, I think it was, they preached, and so Peter said. Yeah. They all preached, but Peter's kind right. of the front man, if you will, of the band. Um, so you have two guys here, and you have, it. you know, it's a... Uh, uh, Shane and Shane, if you will. <laughs> which one? Which? That's a that's a deep cut joke for oh, for you cuts. Christians out there. But uh, you have two guys, and then they they get radically saved in a moment, right? right? Um, and then at the end, they you know they're they're healed. They're whole. Um, they don't. They're I wouldn't even say they're disciples because they haven't even followed anything, right? Like they're just healed and whole. Put clothes on. Yeah, and they're like, hey, exactly. That's their discipleship is they put clothes on. Um, but they they're talking to Jesus and they're Jesus. We wanna we wanna follow you. Can we follow you? And he goes, no no no. Just go home and and share your story of what what what's happened to you. No Bible school, no discipleship, nothing. Just go tell your story. Hadn't even heard one of Jesus main things he would tell stories when he would tell stories <laughs> like they hadn't heard any of it thing and they they di- they didn't even have theology like yeah they met a guy and they were set free <clears throat> that's the basis of their theology <laughs> <laughs> so they go home and uh what's really cool is i got to visit israel a number of years ago um, did you go to the decapolis area yeah oh. so we went over there oh, okay. oh dude well and that's where i learned i uh, the lady was sharing how archaeologists over the years have been, you know, excavating that whole area. And, mm-hmm. and basically, they just kept finding church after church. Because it was church, a large church, church, Gentile church, area yeah. when they, Jesus yeah. crossed the boat on the, on the boat, right? Exactly. So there wasn't any yeah. Jesus evangelism yet. Right. And any of the Jewish the nationality, right, any of the Jewish nationality people that would have been there mm-hmm. were, were all Hellenistic, all Greek. Right. They all gave up. Yeah. Um... And so there's just church after church after church. And she goes, you know, the, the conclusion that we, we come to is in light of this one story that we read in these three Gospels, obviously it just spread like wildfire there. The message of Jesus through two guys who hadn't been to Bible school who just got radically saved for Jesus. Yeah. Um, so again, so you have the well story, people coming to Jesus. Mm-hmm. The Gadarenes, the, the, that story, you have, you have miraculous moment. Share your story, church. Right. Um, and then my my favorite one is uh, Revelation, um, which shameless, shameful plug, shameless plug, <laughs> shameless. Yeah. We're gonna be releasing I'm just doing it. <laughs> we're gonna be releasing a Revelation um, podcast series. It will be a six part series. Each episode is at minimum two hours, but it's how does that go with your seminar? Your life. It goes, it'll go person. after it. It'll go after. But here's here's what I love is is me and my friend Phil who are do, going through it. We make Revelation apply to us today. And what I mean is is go find your bunker and get groceries. What I mean is so how does Jesus' victory over the enemy apply in our marriage? It, it is last week, man. It was probably one of the most powerful podcasts because we both just started like. There were, there were these aha moments that we were just kind of pinging back uh-huh. and forth. And it's, anyways, this is one of them. This was the, the section actually that we were reading is in the middle of Revelation 12, which is a parenthetical chapter within Revelation. Um, it's like a commercial break. <laughs> it's the way I say it. Um, uh, 12, 11, it says, and they overcame him. This is the enemy because of the blood of the lamb. So who Jesus was, what he accomplished on our behalf, and the word of their testimony, the word of their story. 
and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Um, which in America, we're not often faced with death as right. Christians, <clears throat> but I would argue, what about your reputation? What about getting fired from a job if people know you're a Christian? Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be a dingbat Christian. Don't be a dingbat Christian. Right. But if you just live your life as a Christian who loves Jesus, yeah. not and, and not and even that reputation, not just oh he's a you know he's a Christian, but like people going don't invite them. They're, they they go to church all the time. And they believe in Jesus, and they'll be a downer for well, well you know. And it's not yeah. that people want to like snort yeah. cocaine necessarily. They don't invite you over, but like yeah. maybe they just don't want you around mm -hmm. because of the one you follow. Well, I there's I, a death to relationships. We had we had one. I'm, I got to tell this story as vaguely as possible. <laughs> um, we vague had vague. we had a a homeschool event where a lady got hurt, and uh, as we've been developing our our healing ministry here at HCF obviously being challenged to pray for people in the moment. And Lacey's had several moments at garage sales in public where she'll pray for someone and they're like, something happened. And Lacey's like, oh, tell me about it. They're like, no, it, it, it feels weird. I don't, <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> and Lacey, like, we're just kind of sharing, you know, what, what we're doing. <clears throat> and so Lacey's like, hey, can I, this lady got hurt. She goes, hey, can I pray for you? Like I said, it's a homeschool event. Very bun and, and uh, um, denim dress, you know, kind of a homeschool event and um, or people. And she's like, hey, I'm, you got your ankle got hurt. Can I pray for you? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and so Lacey prays, uh, prays in a way of not like, oh, Lord, if it's your will, <laughs> if she prays very authoritatively, you know, Jesus, we speak to this ankle. We we in Jesus name command it by your blood to come into alignment with how how you designed it and, mm -hmm. and, um, very authoritatively. Yeah. And, and the lady's like, and then Lacey's like, Hey, do you feel anything? And she's like, Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> and Lacey's like, you know, just in praying, do you feel, does it feel any different? You know, how does it feel? And she's like, uh, it's fine. And, the, and then just like ho hobbles <laughs> off. But it's interesting. Lacey has prayed with people complete pagans, non-Christians, people who don't necessarily right. she's like, Hey, can I pray for you for this? And they're like, yeah, sure. And then they pray, and then like something starts happening. Um, and then with someone you perceive to be a Christian, she's like, hey, can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Expecting this pithy, in Jesus' name, you know, if it's your will. And then Lacey's like, no, praying for it, and how they freak out. But it's interesting how, uh, I forget where I was going with that story, but um, dealing with we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of Fresh our story. Death, That's yeah. right, like, it... What's interesting is it may be other Christians who your reputation right. is now tainted by, is now mm -hmm. people yeah. who, who marginalize you, is other Christians. Right. right. That blows my mind. Um, so it's, it's this idea of... I'll, it, I'll say this. In my life, if I were to line up 10, ten you know, stories... Probably 90% of opposition in my life, and I haven't always been perfect, but like opposition against You're, you're just talking about best case scenario, you've been loving Jesus. You've yeah. Been, right, right. Or people who claim to be Christians. Yeah. Um, I get that there are lost people that don't want to know have anything to do with Jesus. Yeah. But I have rarely had anybody be like, rah, rah, rah. I mean, right. even those who live, uh, I mean, just when we're in San Antonio, just time after time, the Lord would bring like, kind of wild or alternative lifestyle sure. people into my life. Yeah. And I, I never, I never got a, a little bit at the beginning maybe, but like yeah. 10 minutes into a conversation, you know, and I, I never had one person say I couldn't pray for them. Yeah. But I did have people say, you, you shouldn't go around praying for everyone. <laughs> now those people go to church every week. That, see, that's my story, you know, as far as uh, experience. As we've had... As we've had, uh, as we've started HCF Freedom, and I would even say the more we've actually pressed into the the supernatural, the spiritual mm -hmm. stuff, um, all exclusively, all of our opposition has come from believers um, going, oh, that's that cult church. That's mm -hmm. that church mm -hmm. or that ministry. It's funny, even other ministries we've had, they're like, oh, they, they don't do it right. It's actually demonic how they do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
which I don't know if that's a good plug for what we do, <laughs> but but it's it, it's interesting. It's it's fascinating to me. You would think we're on the same team. We're loving Jesus. We want people set free, just as you guys do. And and it's it's the ministries soapbox time ministries <laughs> set up to play clips of pastors and then rip those pastors apart. Mm-hmm. To me, I'm like you you are you are on the team of the accuser of the brethren right, right here. Um, now, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come the, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them before them, sorry, he who accuses them before our God day and night, and they overcame him, the believers, they overcame him, the accuser, because of the lamb, blood of the lamb and the word of their story. Mm-hmm. Um, it, is, it is fascinating how many believers are operating in the ministry of the accuser. Yeah. I'll say this, like, like I'll take Stephen Furtick. I, I, I've never met the man. I've always had a high regard for him. I'm not a fan of like his preaching. I love his books. Yeah. I love the worship that comes, yeah. but I, I, I applaud how he started in a garage and yeah. what God's done. I've never, he's attacked weekly, Constantly. multiple yeah. times. And I've never seen one be a, a non-Christian. Mm-hmm. It's always some, and, and I would say they, tend on the extreme reform side attacking him for being happy i don't know uh but but there there's always a two minute clip yeah. and yeah. and i can almost guess the entire context of it because i every time i've come across it and it's bothered me enough mm-hmm. i've gone and found the whole thing and i'm like yeah they they took oh. a minute 14 out of out of a 45 minute sermon and he was making a point or he was making fun of or something but they took that part so he's an heretic now and and it's 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 a hundred percent of the time. I blame you for the rant. I blame you. <laughs> the worst documentary I've ever seen is called The American Gospel. The reason I say that is um, the sermons. And I'm not going to say for everyone, but I'm saying the the sermons from Bethel specifically because that's the one I've researched the most. <clears throat> Every single sermon they quote, if you scrubbed front, forward or backward 60 seconds, you would get the context of what they're saying. Sure. It's not even hard. It's not even hard. And, and it's purposeful. It, this is what I mean by there are, there's more division in the body, which is incredibly sad to say, which, which goes to all of Paul's letters, including Peter and James and in Hebrews, where it talks about maturity Mm-hmm. is being able to be in unity in spirit with other believers. Right. How many ministries are immature ministries based on division and disunity and the accusation of, mm-hmm. of the body? Anyways, that's my, <laughs> that's my soap. So like soap. those churches and leaders of those churches, they're rejected constantly, right? They... I mean, they are. Yes. So how do they not... Tap out, give in, get angry. I mean, I'm so sure sometimes they do get so hurt that they just want to go uh, on a lengthy sabbatical and never come back. I mean, what do they do with that kind so, of stuff? Okay, like I said, Bill Bill Johnson and Bethel are is probably the church I've researched the most. To a lesser extent, Joel Osteen and um, I forget what his church is called. Do you remember? Lake Way. Lake, Lake, Lake Way. Lake Way. Lake Way. Yeah. Um, so Bethel. Bill Johnson, most familiar with, to a lesser extent, Lakeway with with Joel Osteen. Both of them have said, uh, Bill Johnson in an interview and Joel Osteen in his book, Blessed in the Darkness, one of the it's good book. One of the best books I've I've read. Just take the jacket cover off with his face on it. It I did. It makes it. I did. I, I did think both, I think I bought us both. One yeah. And I took him yeah. off. <laughs> it uh, it just it's a little bit better. Anyways, um, in both of their books, they had a moment um with or in both of their experiences, Joel Osteen in his book, Bill Johnson in in an interview. <clears throat> Bill Johnson said God took him around to every business in town, just kind of on a walk through the mm-hmm. city. And he had the, him stop in front of every business and God goes, okay, if you're, um, uh, if you're, what is it like demeaned? What is, what's the word where you're like, if you're made fun of by this business, mm-hmm. by this business owner, are you okay? Yes. Okay. Take him to the next business. Okay. Yeah. If this person rejects you, 
are you, are you going to still do what I say? Yes. Okay. Move on. He goes, he goes, by the end of it, I was just weeping because I'm like, oh, what did I agree to? Like <laughs> I, I said, yes, at every moment. And some of them were friends. Some of them, I know the churches they attend. Some of them, I know this, you know what I mean? Like it's his hometown. He knows, right. you know, and, um, and just being able to go. Yeah. I'll, I'll still follow mm -hmm. you. Um, and then Joel Osteen in a similar way <clears throat> where specifically dealing with the church that, uh, the building that he was buying, um, mm -hmm. he's like, everyone ridiculed me that mm -hmm. there's no way you're going to get that contract. There's no way, you know, you're just doing this for your own, own right. whatever. And he's like, I don't want it. God told me to pursue this. And they're like, you just want to be, you know, better than, bigger than everyone else. He's like, I, I have a stutter and I don't want this. I don't want to be the, I'm not the best <laughs> preacher. The, and it's yeah. interesting when you hear his story about how nervous he gets in front of people, how much he stutters in front of people. Um, he goes, the, like, people make fun of him for being so calculated because mm -hmm. he's memorized his sermon so he doesn't stutter and isn't nervous. Like, right. what a different Gracefield perspective. Anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, I think it's in these moments where the individual person has to make the choice, God, okay, I'll do this simply because I, I, I trust you and you're asking me to, mm -hmm. and I believe it'll be good. Um, yeah. So the, the way we live our lives, that's a story. Yeah. It's being played out. And then we yeah. tell our story yeah. as well, or, or parts of it where God does something. Because you have yeah. the question... I wrote so many notes, I can't find your but <laughs> Oh, so many notes. I have none. He has all the notes now. <laughs> In talking with others, what parts of your past, or that part of your story, yeah. do you shy away from telling? Yeah. Um, or maybe even if you're living, if your story is being lived out, what, what part of you kind of shy away from letting be known even? Um, you know, and, and, I, okay. I, and I, I, I was thinking about it because obviously you, you gave me the handout. So I was, I was like, well... I said, I don't really shy away from telling any of my story, but when I'm not there, like when I'm not in a Jesus moment, yeah, I, I wrote, generally when I feel judgment looming, mm. I might, uh, I might yes, uh, yes. extremely generalize the story or, uh, or talk about, you know, oh, I grew up in San Marcos, you did too. Uh, <laughs> so my story is yeah, yeah. superficial. Yeah. If, yeah. I, if I'm not, and then sometimes... Sometimes I'm like, hey, judgment's coming. It's, it's coming. And I'm just going to tell my story, and you can yeah. judge us for this or that. Um, and I, I know it's when I feel, I, don't, I wouldn't perceive it as feeling rejected. I'm, I'm feeling like I'm about to be rejected. Right. But, Which is judgmental. If right. being judged is a rejection. But it's also me, you know, just even right now as I'm talking it through, yeah. going, are you, are you not enough, Jesus? Right. <laughs> Are you not enough in that moment for me to go through whatever might come back my way? Because I really yeah. want, and th there's also times when I'm like, oh, I'm going to tell the story because they're going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be, or I, the better way to put it, I'm going to be loved. So it's going to be like a boastful, like, <sighs> check out what I did. Yeah. Ask me more. <laughs> you know, so, so that, you know, that's a needs-based. Yeah. So I have a... Uh, yeah, right. It's it's I get something from my story in right. a way. Yeah, there's there, so I've I have a, a spectrum. So early on, when I was walking out of freedom, my my story of pornography was really shame filled, and you get a lot of knuckleheads saying dumb things about mm -hmm. about pornography and how <laughs> ooh, like it, it was funny. Not to me, to Lacey. Your husband's disgusting. I'm glad my husband doesn't you know, deal with that. Do you remember the one time though, the one worship pastor at the one church where we had our other camp, our fresh start campus yeah. and you told yeah. your story and you're talking about your, your safety measures in essence yeah. that you do to, to live yeah. free as a husband and yeah. everything. Yeah. My guardrails. I yeah, my guardrails. Guardrails. yeah. Yeah. And he was like, Oh, you, you know, why, why do you have to do that? You're not free. <laughs> this is a worship pastor that was on staff with us. <laughs> and like, and I, was, I think we were both sitting up front and I'm like, Wow, what, well, what go, he's stuck in. Here's the thing, I because we know him, we know him. It's those moments where you you pray, Jesus. I know I need a filter, but I don't want to use it. <laughs> I know you. Do we want to have this discussion publicly? Like that's right. where I go. I'm like, you asked me publicly. Are you sure you want to have this conversation publicly? <laughs> oh, you were very good. Oh, good. <laughs> 
I remember because I had had other run-ins, and I was very like, oh, gosh, I just want to say things. But I- Here's the thing. Like, okay, so since we're on it to just get give an answer, the reason I have guardrails in my life is because there's seasons of my life where I'm tired, where I'm frustrated, where I'm disappointed, where I want to do stupid things. And the guardrails protect me from doing stupid things yeah. in those moments. Yeah. I don't always need mm-hmm. the... It's it's like when you're bowling um, and you have bumpers. You know when you put the bumpers mm-hmm. in so you don't get in the gutter? Yeah. That's how I view it. I'm like, most of my... Most of my... Mm-hmm. Bowl, ball, balls? Bowling balls are going down the center of the right. lane. But man, there's one where I slip and it... Right. You know? Oh, I got the, the guardrails. And circumstances. I mean, look, guardrails on... Like, on a mountain yeah. winding pass. Like our friend Joe who puts up guardrails. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's why. Is it The reason I have guardrails in my life is because I know there's moments where either I will trip and by God's grace that guardrail keeps me mm-hmm. from doing something stupid or I'm just exhausted and I want to do mm-hmm. something stupid. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but okay, so I have this, this spectrum of, to your point of the... Dealing with shame, talking to others. What parts of your past do you shy away from telling? So when walking through freedom, pornography was the big one. I I remember when I first started telling my story, I'd be like, I struggled with looking at (laughs) things. And then as I got more confident, more free, more, and it's just been like, no, this is actually part of my story. And the more I tell my story, the more guys come up to me. Hey, can you? So right. Tell me, tell me more about that. What do you, you know? And they, it's actually intriguing. So the now to the other side, though, the judgment side is telling people some of the crazy things that God has asked me to do. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So one is uh, when when God told me to stand out on the corner with a sign that just said Jesus likes you. Mm-hmm. I was like. Oh. <laughs> like, like how that one came about was I was, um, I was uh, blowing the leaves off of my lawn, and I was just thinking about this one guy that, that <coughs> pretty, pretty judgmental, uh, has a pretty judgmental ministry on the corner um, every Wednesday evening, and I was like, God, I wish there was someone to counteract that. Like, counteract the judgment with just love and grace. Like, your love and your grace. He's like, I know. I wish I did too. And I was like, I know. (laughs) Oh, come on! (laughs) And so I just remember praying. I'm like, okay, if someone was going to stand on the corner, what would their sign say? And he goes, I wanted to say Jesus likes me. Or Jesus likes you. And I'm like, I I understand Jesus loves you because that's the Bible. Like, Jesus loves you this Mm -hmm. time. He goes, nope. I, I want people to know that I really enjoy them. Hmm. Like they're my creation. They're my kids yeah. and I enjoy them. <sighs> and so then I had, uh, so I did that for about six months. I think it was and I felt released. I was mm-hmm. like, okay. But I, re- I do remember during that time I would, I would tell, like I heard stories like, Oh yeah. Did you see the guy that was on the corner of the street where, <laughs> where you're just, Jesus he likes you should be love, you know? And, and I'm like, yeah, that's crazy. And they're like, <laughs> they're like the one guy specifically, he was like, I can't believe he would put such a wrong, it was like such an unbiblical thing on his sign. And I was like, yeah, except maybe God told him to put that because he wants people to know how much they enjoy him. And they're like, well, I mean, I'm like, that was, that was me. <laughs> like, it's just one of those moments, right? But it's, it's these crazy stories where you're like, oh, people are going to judge me if I, mm-hmm. in these moments. Like, another one is when, when I felt God, there's a huge conference, worldwide speaker on stage. And I felt God say, wasn't it Bethel guy? Yeah. Okay. And he go, God goes, I, I need you to go sit up on the stage. I was like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Nobody needs anybody. To Nobody needs <laughs> anything. That's, everyone's great here. <laughs> but it was something God was doing very specifically in my heart, which goes back to acceptance. Mm-hmm. Is I, I re- very distinctly. So this is the thing that I feel broke my need for permission or acceptance from especially leaders that I serve. And I don't mean this in a way of I'm not submitted to them. What I mean is there was areas of my heart. I, I wanted to be approved of, mm-hmm. I wanted to be accepted in their eyes. Right. Um, and what God did at this conference is he goes, Nate, I need you to go stand up or sit on that stage. 
Um, and I didn't make a big show of it. I just sat kind of on stage, but on the corner. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't want to make a big, big show of it. But basically, I was like, oh, they're going to kick me off. I'm going to get kicked out. Like, security is going to come. <laughs> but it was one of those moments where God is, will you do everything that I tell you to do? Hmm. No equivocations, nothing um, based on what others, so, what someone else gives you permission to do. Yeah. Will you only do what I tell you to do? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so we don't have to do that, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. but I'm willing. <clears throat> don't but that, it was like a 45-minute sermon where I'm just sitting on stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, th no, that's where, you know, dealing with this acceptance, which is something I've struggled with for my, for as long as I could remember. And God's taken me through these like levels mm -hmm. of, of healing that. And that was the last level that I've had to walk through where he's like, Nate, I'm going to break this off of you. Mm. Your desire to, um, cause I remember it was right when we were launching HCF freedom. And there was several things where I was telling Lace, I was like, um, babe, what, you know, what about this? And I need to get Scott's permission for this. And I need to get Jeremy's permission for this to do this, which both of you are, are very free and like, Hey, you have a ministry heart. We know each other too. There's a reputation that's been built. I needed your permission so that I felt, uh, permitted or what's the right word what's what's the maybe the word i'm thinking of almost like approved approved of yes yeah i wanted permission not to do what i was gonna do but to be approved of like mm -hmm. good job nate yeah, yeah it, and so this is separate from submission like it it, it was something in my own right. heart that i know some people listening are like oh so you're not submitted to one that's not what i'm talking mm -hmm. about it's something that needed to be broken off of my own heart and i knew what it was like i knew the difference um mm -hmm. Is that, and is yeah, and I think like you can even be, I mean, I was raised, you know, by a military officer, Green Beret, you know, all this. So I, part of what was instilled in me was honor and submission yeah. and I agreed with it. I didn't have a problem with yeah. it. I don't I'm know. Not, I'm not, I mean, I had issues with certain people cause you know, I'm me, but, <laughs> but so I didn't just honor and submit leaders because, and then on the inside, I was standing up fighting. I didn't do that, but right. I, I, I'm not accepted by anybody was my right. belief. Right. I'm not good enough for anybody. So I had to prove my worth, but I was fine being honored and submit. So yeah. we, we, sometimes we're like, well, I, and, and I would have argued, well, I'm, I'm great at submitting to leaders and honoring. So I don't have any issues. Yeah. That would have been my ignorant fallback not even my willful fallback right right um and i think that's what you get people like if you're talking about because anytime you're talking about rejection you're also going to have to talk about acceptance yeah right they yeah. go hand in hand you have to deal with them both yeah um at one is get set free and healed the other is step into the truth of yeah um but what do you say like to the person because we get on the yeah re rebellious versus religious but the person who hey do you have do you think you have rejection issues no i'm accepted i'm accepted by jesus because he accepts us all yeah now a lot of times that's like but right i don't know well and that's the i think that's where taking uh uh oh i did this in our training the other night um where i said there's a difference between just quoting bible verses or tr quoting truisms mm -hmm. versus actually quoting the father's heart for you and i think that's what it gets down to is okay are you are you quoting a truism that you've been told i'm accepted in the beloved yep it, you know it's under the blood whatever it, just all those truisms yeah. but are they the way the fruit i see of your life shows me you don't walk in that are they live isms Ooh. <laughs> I'm writing that down for my only note that I'm writing for Wednesday. <laughs> my favorite is last week when you made that really great quote and I, qu I wrote it down while we were doing the podcast. Yeah. And then on Wednesday night, I quoted you. You're like, I said that? And I'm like, yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, that's right. I did it. <laughs> you said, and you looked at my notes and it had quotes. <laughs> it was such a good one. Pull the vulnerable trigger. That's what you had said. <clears throat> but yeah, it's truism versus livism. Like, yeah. Right, is it? And how many people would let truth... Like say, well, truth trumps it. Mm -hmm. Truth has to trump it. And it's like, of course, truth yeah. is truth. But are you, are you living it? Yeah. Proves it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for listening to our podcast. This is one of the many resources we make available for free at our website, cultivaterelationships.com. Our resources have helped people grow 
in their relationship with God and others, uh, we've seen people set free from uncontrollable anger and paralyzing fear. We've witnessed estranged family members be reunited after working through our freedom booklet. We've helped people build healthy relationship and coping habits through our coaching videos. And all of these resources are made available for free because of the generous support of people like you. If you would like to become a partner, please visit cultivaterelationships.com slash support. Now, I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. And so, yeah, we have these two sides of messy spectrum dealing with, with, you know, telling our messy story. And um, let me draw this. And this is also the story of the, what's famously known as the prodigal. Yeah. Son, so Matthew, everybody's prodigal in the story. Ma- hey, can you, do you have a Bible? Can you look up what Matthew I have a nine? Bible is? right here. I have, well, <laughs> Bible. Uh, I have Matthew nine on there, and I don't. You don't, I don't know re- why. I don't remember. It was in the notes. It was really good. Mm. But it's uh, um, if we have a, a messy spectrum, let me write this down. So messy one side would be uh, rebellious. Oh, it's so when he calls Matthew to follow him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, Rebellious and religious. So, um, and then, oh, yeah, it says, so Matthew followed him, but then it says that he hung out with sinners. It's like right after that. Right. Um, And so you have this messy spectrum, and I don't want to say people are either or. Either they're rebellious or either they're religious. We all have these rebellious religious stuff in our hearts. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so, in Luke, so in that, Luke 15, Jesus tells the story of the, I call it the rebellious son and the religious son, uh, because he contrasts them really well, and they both have mess. Like, they both have areas of their heart that have not been revealed to their dad, right? Right. Because the whole story is the dad and the two sons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, Jesus desires to walk with him as he designed us, no matter what side of the messy spectrum we are on. He really loves who we really are. And I I love that phrase. And so it's this idea of what areas of our heart are are we rebellious, where we reject, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Or or maybe it's, it's, you know what, Jesus says, or, or, you know, my identity is this, but I don't believe it. I can't achieve it. I'm not even going to try, so I'm just going to go down to this or whatever, however Mm -hmm. distorted view of your identity that you have. So it might be like... Uh, I'm, well, I'm just a sinner. I actually was listening to a podcast this week where the guy's like, well, you know, we're all human, so we do this. And and the guy's like, no, 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 no. We don't have to, though. <laughs> and <laughs> but basically, the one guy was just like sloughing it off to, well, we're all sinners, right? Right. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen, so it's fine if I do that. And, uh, or, so... Or the other side is religious. What rules do we have? What expectations do we have for ourselves and others to follow? Mm-hmm. Um, and to be accepted? To be accepted, to be loved, to right. be um, whatever, favor, what, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so what rules do we have for people uh, and even ourselves? Like you were saying, right. I got to do these things and I'll be accepted. And so your one life, your one area of your life was task driven religious right but in your heart you were like those idiots cuz i mm-hmm. i can do it they can't do it they're yeah. you know so that's your rebellious side right um and so the <laughs> the idea is jesus desires us to walk with him as he designed us no matter what side of the messy spectrum we are on i think i already read that that he loves us who we really are um and so i think it's it's worth worth examining what areas of my heart am I rebellious against Jesus? What areas of my heart am I religious? Um, I do a teaching. Ooh, I'm going to write this down in my notes. So why does a person fall on one side or or have a swirl and mix them both, you know? Mm -hmm. It's a Mm -hmm. good swirl. Uh, Some swirls are good. I think it's like a pendulum thing. Uh, I think of the uh, vanilla chocolate swirl. Oh, I was going to say yin-yang. But yeah, I like... like... (laughs) Because it's all mixed in there. Yeah. Sometimes I like this one more, sometimes I like that one more. But like, why does a person... What happens that a person goes there or goes theirs? (laughs) Goes... What do you mean? What do you mean? Like, Starts doing this one or that one. Like... Is it, is it a, is it like I failed and this was the response? So I'm just going to be this way or, you know, this happened to me. 
I, if I'm understanding your question, like, so the the mm -hmm. the son who ran away, yeah, what's well, famously known as the prodigal, um, for whatever reason, he's just like, I'm just gonna go wild. Yeah, I'm done with yep. the dad's rules. Yep, that's what it seems yeah. like. I'm yeah. done with dad's rules, so I'm just gonna go live my own life. Right. So something happened in his mind or heart. Yeah. That made him just go. I'm out of here. And the other one was like. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm always gonna earn, and he's gonna like me the most. Okay. So <laughs> let me let me address the rebellious one first. Okay, mm -hmm. with a story. You can judge me as a parent <laughs> if you would like. <laughs> so for years we have a we have a policy: no sleepovers. It's just our policy as mm -hmm. a family. We don't do sleepovers. We don't have friends sleep over at our house. Our girls don't get to sleep over at friends' houses. Okay. It across the board. Doesn't matter how much we love you or trust you. It's just across the board, no sleepovers. Um, and then we have we have uh, pinwheel phones, which are can be completely locked down um, from from the actual hardware to software. Everything can be locked down. We have full control. Um, uh, and so, like like our girls look at us like, oh, why are you so controlling, you <laughs> monsters? You know. Um, and so for years, like, we've just been getting this, like, why are you so controlling? My my friends get to do this. And we're like, yeah, we're not your friends' parents. Like, you start using lines that your parents gave you, you know? <laughs> uh, and so it's like, they're not my kids, and, and I don't care about them. I care about you, and mm -hmm. whatever, whatever lines, right? Years, we've been dealing with this. And finally, like, our girls are just like, you guys are so controlling and mean. We're like, okay. So the other night we're like we're gonna watch a net we're gonna watch some episodes with you guys called C to catch a predator. <laughs> 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 so we turn on Chris Hansen <laughs> to catch a predator, which is a uh, from 2007 to 2011, I think, mm -hmm. was this popular show where they would catch um, uh, pedophiles through sting operations, and then Chris Hansen would confront. And mm -hmm. <laughs> Is so awesome. <laughs> so we get done. Uh, we get done. We spent like two hours, an hour and a half, whatever, just watching episode after episode. And and we turn to the girls and, and we're like, so do you guys think we're monsters who are con trying to control you? And Lydia's face is like, <laughs> no. <laughs> we're like, guys, we it's because we have good for you that we've put these guardrails up in your life. Right. Yes, some of it, some of it is for you not to do stupid things. Mm -hmm. But I would argue the majority of what we do as parents, mean, mean Lacey, I'm, I'm speaking, is so that people don't get in. The, 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 the wall that we put around you is so that people can't come in and hurt you. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the rules that we have. Right. That's why we have the the curfews that we have. That's why we have the restrictions that we have is so that other people can't hurt you. Um, so I think what the rebellious son saw was just rules and regulations. Like meant to stifle his screw, life. Yeah, screw you, dad. <clears throat> I'm out. Right. And, and right. And, and the father is a loving father. He's like, oh, okay, because I've given you that freedom, mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to, you're not going to be a hostage. <laughs> like, it's not going to be a hostage negotiation, right? So then the other brother <clears throat> is coming from the other side of it, though. And here's, here's my, here's my, uh, an, or I guess here's my thought is he felt unapproved of. And so he had to go work in the, in the field. Mm -hmm. Why is why is the older brother working in the field? That's where the slaves and, and hired hands work. Right. He shouldn't even be out there. Right. And yet that's where we find him when the story... He's living like a slave to earn his sonship. Yes. <laughs> and the one guy rejected his sonship because he thought it was about rules. Right. It, and it's funny. The father is the father. He has an unchanging character. <laughs> right. And yet it's us in our perceptions. And I would even say perceptions based on... Uh, a lack of trust, a lack of, uh, yeah, trust, dependence on, mm -hmm. maybe they, he knows more than me, kind of an idea. Yeah. And so it's, it's this idea, I think, it, but now, again, like I said, we, I think what Jesus is pointing out is a singular person's heart. This is not people versus people. I think right. it's, I think the, the messiness of our heart, which is <clears throat> why I love the passage in Jeremiah 17, um, 
uh, let me let me read it. It's, well, it's interesting too, like with the re- with the rebellious brother, the yeah. younger prodigal. When he came back, his thought was, "I will be religious." Mm-hmm. And I, oh, so I'll do I, what my older brother does. Yeah, to yeah. earn your favor, and yeah. I, I'll never be your son, but oh, at least you'll accept point. me. Yeah. So he thought if I just go do what that guy does, then I'm. How many people when they're saved look at or become? They they lived a crazy lifestyle, mm-hmm. and they go to a conservative church or a church that's full of rules and legalism because yeah. it's safe. Get my tie. Yeah, because it's like I know where the opposite goes, and Jesus is like, we don't have we don't have to do the spectrum. That's why a re- that's why having people that just hey yes. you really this is who you really are because when it came down to it, the woman at the well, the uh, the the demoniac is who set free the the two brothers. Uh, Jesus knew I really made you a certain way. Mm-hmm. And I just want you to be how I really created you. Right. You don't have to act this or that. Um, okay, so I'm going to read Jeremiah 17, 9. Uh, I'm going to read it in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, because it's, I would say it renders it more faithfully to what the Hebrew understanding mm-hmm. was. So Jeremiah 17, 9, if you're reading this in any other translation you will get a wrong perception of what... The message is closer. It is closer. So here's Jeremiah 79 in the Septuagint. The heart is deeper than all things. A person is also. Who will understand him? I, the Lord, who visits hearts and tests the kidneys. Like I said, that's what the... <laughs> that's where they thought the, the guts, you know, that's where they thought uh, motive came from. To give each according to his ways and according to the fruit of his pursuits. So basically the idea is this. The heart is is uh, deeper, confusing. So in some translations you'll you'll see it say the heart is deceptive above mm-hmm. all things. That word for deceptive is perplexing. It's the idea of perplexing, confusing, deep, like a, an mm-hmm. abyss, an unsearchable abyss kind of an idea. Um, who can understand it? And I love that. It says, hey, listen, even y- like, okay, Scott, have you ever done this where you've said something and like, as you're saying it, you're like, oh no, dude, come like, back, come back to me. And it's like, why did I say that? Oh my goodness. Why did I do that? We don't even know why we do right. things, but then we judge others for doing stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's, this has brought me so much clarity. Like, okay, God, I'm, I know my heart towards you and, and I, f- or I feel my, my, my heart toward you. And I'm going to pursue you, even if I make a mistake, you know my heart. And, right. and I think that's, I, I, I don't think I coined the phrase, I think someone else, I think I got it from someone smarter. But basically this idea of, I would rather fail forward than not do anything. Mm-hmm. I would rather make a mistake in my pursuit of God, of, of seeking him, of doing what, what, not just what he wants out of duty. I, I mean that as, mm-hmm. as my whole heart. Like, I want to please him. Um, I would rather fail in that pursuit than wait and not do anything until I'm certain it will work out perfectly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a big believer that, that failure is never really failure. Shh. I know. It's a secret. <laughs> I mean, and, and it's funny because, like, the place I learned it the most, at a Reformed church in San Antonio... And sometimes I I walked, I, I mean, even now I look back and I'm just giggle. I'm like, how did that place teach me anything except that the <laughs> Lord is faithful? Yeah. But yeah. like, I'm like, yeah, fail because we just, that was kind of our big, one of our big things because we had a lot of brand new believers came into the church for the first time, get saved, never been to church before. So they were messy. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, hey, your failures never failure. Yeah. It's now, of course, their belief was God ordained it so that, you know, he's like, he had you do this and that, my, and, you know, but so th- they took it with the wrong Calvin moment. My, my favorite is Driscoll, Mark Driscoll, one of my favorite, I'd say probably my favorite reformed pastor. Mm-hmm. He's slightly less reformed now. Um, yeah. He's is when he's like, <laughs> he calls it duck, duck, damn. <laughs> God's mm-hmm. up in heaven. Duck, duck, damn. Sorry. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So the question, like the the, just kind of the thought provoking question in this part is, in which circumstance or relationship have you been tempted to go to the rebellious side or to the religious side, and why? So you want somebody to, to answer like, uh, when I'm, 
you know, when job's not working out, like what are you what are you looking for somebody to write so, down so they okay. can deal with stuff? So here's a here's a great example. Lacey calls me a crisis Calvinist. So I'm all about like free will and and <laughs> and God's you know through the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm able to choose and do and and act and behave and and mm-hmm. and sometimes with the Holy Spirit, sometimes on my own and whatever you know. Um, but she calls me a Calvinist crisis or a crisis Calvinist because when stuff's going wrong, I'm like. Phew, it's all him anyways. <laughs> like, he ordained it. Exactly to what you're saying. So, so I think that's where my, my maybe legalistic or religious side, like, mm-hmm. like whatever. Uh, uh, and I would say when, uh, so the other part of that religious side is I'm a task-oriented list maker. So I will make lists just to be able to check them off so that I've done something. <laughs> and so when, when my life feels out of control, Scott, mm-hmm. it could be... It could be in my relationship with Lacey. It could be in my medical uh, situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I I tend to get a little twitchy toward lists. Like, I need a list. I need to control. I need to, you know, check boxes. <laughs> Somebody it, right? tell me I've done something today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I've controlled this thing in my, in my life today. Um, so that's when it does it for me is when areas of my life become out of my control. Mm-hmm. I tend to go religious. I tend to go that way. Now, rebellious. Also, when my, particularly my identity has been questioned, Mm -hmm. um, and that again could come from relationship, that again could come from circumstance, um, that's where I tend to go rebellious, where it's like, Okay, to be to feel important, I want to go look at pornography, hmm. and so that's the rebellious side yeah. that goes that goes that way. And here's Scott. This is the this is both a truism and livism. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, the over the years, as I've looked at my in and in kind of like assessed my addiction uh, when I was addicted to pornography, the more addicted to and giving into pornography that I was, the more legalistic outwardly towards others I be- I would become. Hmm. It was this weird juxtaposition that as I was struggling deeply in this addiction, I also would become more harsh and judgmental towards others. Sure. And the Did more- it make you feel better or equal? Like, I can see where, like, did you feel like, I'm feeling so bad, I need to see where they are? I think the, no, I think it actually, I think it actually came from a self-loathing and frustration toward myself that at huh. least I could maybe control others if I couldn't okay. control myself. Now, I think you, that's how. When you ask this question, you don't yeah. have the word or in there. It has and. So do you believe that most people oh, have yeah. rebellious, they, they, something happens and I go rebellious, and, and I also have something where I sometimes go religious? Uh, it, it might be just different things. Okay. I, I think we have both. I, you know, I think we have both, um, especially the less uh, we've allowed the spirit to move, probably the more uh, back and forth we become. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, I, obviously I believe that as we walk in the spirit, we don't have to I, go to either of those. Yeah. You know, there's times sure we have to release to God. We have to pray. We have to bring our frustrations to him, yeah. but I don't think we have to live it out, um, as much, but yeah, I think it's a both end. I think it's a, Hey, what do you, what rules expectations <laughs> do you make, uh, for others? And then what, maybe what areas of rebellious where you're like, I know this is wrong. Um, and here's the here's the thing is is it's funny we often think of conservatives or fundamentalists as the religious people, mm-hmm. but we also know charismatics who are like these are the rules that a good charismatic needs sure. to follow, or people who are anti-religion. I I'm never going to a church. Anyone who goes to a church is this. You have to not go to a church. <laughs> yeah. That's equally yeah. religious and binding and accusatory. Right. Um, so the religion, please don't think like Pope, hat, cape, whatever when we say religious. Just simply what are expectations that you put on yourself or others to follow mm-hmm. to meet your standard of good. That's that Jesus what religion wouldn't is. do. That, yeah. He wouldn't put that on you. Well, and even, no, no, because we're talking about acceptance. Right. Jesus doesn't put anything on us for acceptance. Right. That's the... 
<laughs> thing. And it's like, God, perfect. Shh, always, yeah. you know, creator can yeah. snap his finger. All the stuff uh, comes back from the dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, stole the keys yeah. to hell. Yeah. Uh, and he has no, like, he didn't have one bullet point to-do list. So this is the... To be accepted? Ex just one thing, right? According to the Calvinist, it'd be faith that God gives you. Anyways, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is a fun joke. Okay, Zing. so here's the thing. In which circumstance or relationship have you been tempted to go to that re re rebellious side or that religious side? And why? Like, why do you, why do you go there? Like, give yourself a self-assessment. So here's, here's the thing, though, is kind of going back to the idea of, we, well, you guys never talk about sin or righteousness or anything like that. Okay, this goes to Romans 8, uh, mm. 1 through 11. Our design is, is uh, for those of you who like math, you'll love this. It's flesh uh, plus Holy Spirit equals design. Or na uh, I'll, I'll say natural. That's natural. That's who we are designed to be. And I use that term natural because that's what Romans 1 uses. As people give up the Holy Spirit, they become mm -hmm. unnatural. In their in their desires, so flesh um, minus Holy Spirit equals then unnatural, <clears throat> uh, and so it's Romans one. Is this your one of your favorite passages? Romans eight. Yeah, Romans eight one through eleven, or is that Michael's? It must be Michael. Maybe it was. Okay. Well. Romans, it's not going to be in the Septuagint. Um, let me go here. Okay, it's a long, long section. But the reason I'm talking about flesh, you'll see, because <laughs> he, he talks about it a lot. So verse, chapters 8, 1 through 11. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So, Scott, we're going to be set free? Or we are set free. I mean, free. It says we are. But Scott, remember that. Remember, Paul says, "I war with myself, and and that he's the chief of all sinners, and and that oh, who could set set me free from this from this warring that I have within myself?" Mm -hmm. I've had so many people quote that to me recently. Like at least three, at least. <laughs> oddly enough, unrelated. And they're like, Nate, you got to remember, Paul had this warring in himself. And I go, yes, he did. You're absolutely right. Before he became a Christian. Yes, he had a battle in his mind before he became a Christian. So that's what all chapter seven is about. The end of seven, after this warring back and forth, he says this, verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then on one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as though... Uh, Weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. <laughs> Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So now he's saying, as a Christian, mm -hmm. we no longer walk according to the flesh. We walk according to the spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who walk according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So he, he goes, chapter 7, I warred. I mm -hmm. warred between my flesh and the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But now I'm in Christ Jesus, and I just follow the Spirit. Right. And here's, here's the hard part is people cherry pick chapter 7 to go, oh yeah, brother, I understand how you're struggling. Paul struggled. We all struggle. It's a struggle. And I'm like, what a setup for failure. Right. Not just a setup for failure, you're also taking out of context what, the, what Paul's talking about. Because here he says, now I don't. Okay, so to play devil's advocate. Fine. Uh, what about the person who, like, okay, Nate, I love it. <clears throat> Year later, yeah. they fall into 
you know, uh, they lose the job, circumstances, it's just, yeah. you know, a wife gets you know, found out she has cancer, it's hard right now, and he goes back into an old habit, we'll just say porn. Yeah. So then, well, how do you answer the guy? Because obviously his flesh that he still battled, the old the old enemy came back and, and got him. What do you do with that yeah. in the context of, man, I, I really do believe in Jesus. Right. I just... You know, the flesh one or the sin one. Um, do you remember in First John where we talked about people not having to sin, but... It's four, right? Is it four or five? Is it chapter four? I always thought, I always think of that. Maybe, or is it the entire book? <laughs> <laughs> it's the entire book. <laughs> yeah. John, um, John, that's where he acts like James, in my opinion, in his writing. Yeah. He's like, I'm writing shorter, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm hitting the point. I, I, have a, I have a verse for this. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying, is I, I want to quote the verse. I don't want to just give you a... Living uh, in the light versus if we claim we have no sin. Yeah, where is that at? First John 1, 8. Uh, kind of starts in 1, 5. <clears throat> God is light. There's no darkness in him. That one. Let's see. Keep. Sorry. This is making for a really riveting podcast as I read <laughs> and look through this. Do, 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 um, do, 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 do. um, I'm writing, man, because you overcome. No, I think it's chapter. I thought it was chapter three. He says, little children, I'm writing this so that you don't sin. Maybe I should search that. <laughs> Uh, he goes, little children, I'm writing this Everyone so Everyone who you... sins is breaking God's law. Yeah. That one. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous. That? No, he's, he says specifically, I'm writing this, little children. Oh, here we go. 2.12. Uh, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for uh, his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers. Oh, no, that's not it either. <laughs> Dang it. Maybe it's second. Maybe it's second, uh, John. I don't know because there's no chapters in that one. Oh yeah, that's and true. I always thought there were chapters involved. Uh, let me go back to search. Little children, folks. I am so sorry. Basically, the idea is we don't have to sin, but if we do, we have an advocate with a father who's forgiven us. Um, so now I want to find the verse to just give you confidence in that. Um, Maybe four. Anyways, man, that's going to bug me. Um, yeah, that's going to bug me. He says he says in First John somewhere, somewhere it says, <laughs> I'm going to pull up Paul, whoever wrote Hebrews. Um, somewhere it says in First John or Second John, he's writing to them so that they don't sin. He goes, but if you do, he doesn't say when you do. He goes, but if you do, uh -huh. know that you have an advocate with the Father and you're forgiven. Es essentially is right. how it says. So that's the thing. The guy who's struggling, right? He's pursuing Jesus. And, and I look at that going, you know what? You don't have to sin. But if you do, if you stumble, we have an advocate with the Father. First John 2. Is it First John 2? My little children, I'm writing you these things. They did that. First John 2 what? First John 2, 1, right? Okay. Okay, here we go. Verse 10. Thank you. Thank, thank you. First John, I'm going to go 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Oh, see, Nate? Are you saying you're not a sinner? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. After Jesus, I'm not a sinner. Correct. After I've received his forgiveness, I'm right. not a sinner. Um and then he goes like this, my little children, I'm writing these things to you. Why? So that you may not sin. His whole purpose, John is writing, is so that they don't have to sin. Right. He's not saying, he's not saying, uh, if you confess your sin, uh, if you say that you have not sinned, you make him a liar. No, no, no. If I say, I don't, I don't sin, so I don't need the cross. That's what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. Not, 
in this I didn't need Jesus in the first place. Thank you. Exactly. In the first place. He goes, no, no, no. You're all, you're making him a liar. Mm -hmm. You do need Jesus. My little children, I'm writing this so that you don't sin. And then that second part. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with Father Jesus Christ, the righteous, who made himself the propitiation for sins. Go look at our forgiveness podcast. We talk about propitiation. Um, and not for ours, but those of the whole world. Every single person is forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's whether or not we receive it, personalize it, make it not just a truism, but a liveism. I am going right. to live out of being accepted, being forgiven, being loved. I'm going to live out of that. Right. Um, and that living is, how do I treat others then? In light of that living. Right. Which we'll go to our, our application. Yeah. But, okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. That was a long road. <laughs> but here's the thing. And here's what I need people to understand. This is the Bible nerd in me coming out. It, because I've heard it wrongly cherry picked is, brother, we can't live after the flesh. We only got to live after the spirit. I'm like, okay, hey, listen, I totally agree with you. Okay. But that word for flesh in the, in the Greek is very nuanced. It can be used for a lot of different, <coughs> lot of different circumstances. Okay. It was like, no, brother, just the spirit. I'm like, okay. If you only live after the spirit and not the flesh, you need to stop breathing, eating, and drinking water. Mm -hmm. Because you're feeding your flesh, brother. Right? That's ridiculous. That, right. But that's what I'm saying is this flesh word, depending on the context, has different meanings. And we, Jesus came in the flesh. He didn't come in sin. Right. But he was flesh. He was right. this. And so when Paul, by Romans 8, what he's talking about with regard to flesh is areas of my heart that I've given over to not trusting God. Right? Those mm -hmm. unnatural areas of my heart. So he's, right. he's saying, listen, when we follow after these unnatural desires that we've built up in our heart, rather than the spirit, that's... that's um, that's the contrast. Sorry. And do you think that all has to do with a rejection, acceptance, not believing who I am issue? Totally. Yeah. No, totally. It's, it's, I'm going to feed. So James is the one that really puts the nuance on it because he says, uh, the, it, it, God's not the one who tempts. It's when our desires tempt us. Mm. So let me, let me say it this way. God gave us a design that, I'm going to use food as, okay. as the analogy, okay? God gave us a design in our flesh that it requires food, right? That is natural. Mm -hmm. What Paul is talking about with regard to flesh is this. Um, I am going to starve myself through, is it bulimia or anorexia? I'm going to starve my body the nutrients that it needs. Mm -hmm. I'm following after a desire in my flesh because I need acceptance for how I look or whatever right. the thing is. It's the oftentimes with people who struggle with that, it's more of a control issue. Mm -hmm. This is the one area of my life I can control is food. So I'm going to control it. Um, right. And so that, right, it's your flesh needs food, but you can't follow after your flesh. So, so that's, that's mm -hmm. the hard, essentially <laughs> yeah. that's what the scriptures talk about. And so you have to use discernment to go, wait, what is he referencing here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the reason I'm hitting on this is I've heard flesh used so, so poorly. Right. As, as almost always wicked, always right. wicked, almost like the, the term that's used is like a sinful nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, that's where translations that use sinful nature rather than flesh are adding into a, a meaning that's not there. Um, that, that, that bugs me. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we need to be able to use our brains and go, okay, is he talking about flesh, skin and bone or flesh? Like, mm -hmm. oh, habits I've addicted myself to. Yeah. Um, oh, why did I say that? Oh, yeah. So we, need, <laughs> we are designed to walk empowered by the Spirit. Contrast Paul before the Holy Spirit in Romans 7 with him walking in the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. So what in the world does this have to do with, <laughs> with uh, uh, um, uh, ac acceptance and this is recognizing that we will f we will do things that we've addicted ourselves to for acceptance or things that we've even culturally perceived ourselves to be like this is right culturally and and so I'm going to do the things culturally that bring me acceptance right and we need a god we need we need to receive acceptance from a god who's beyond 
culture. Mm -hmm. And I'm by culture, what I mean is this could be family, nation, or or the world that we've grown up in. Right. Just recognizing, no, a spirit-led lifestyle is the only way you can get yourself out of this approval culture that 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 you're in. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do you intentionally live in the flesh, empowered by the spirit? So again, I hope you understand the nuance that I'm saying here. Right. In the flesh means you have a body with needs. You have flesh and blood with needs. Mm -hmm. Needs that go beyond just food, but that also mean love. Our God has given us a, a natural design toward l being loved, being accepted. Being in community. That's being natural. Being in community, right? So in the flesh, not just in your brain, <laughs> in right. your flesh, what intentionally are you doing to live empowered by the Holy Spirit? Um, I, I guess I'm trying to get away from this question of being too lofty, like... I th did I do that well? <laughs> I'm trying to think. Like, did, am I am I communicating what I mean? Like, I I guess I've heard too many times. Like, oh brother, we just got to pray and read the Bible more. Right. No, that's not not what I'm saying. I'm saying, how do you intentionally live? Not just absorb more truisms. That's okay. That's what it is. I don't want people to just walk away absorbing more truisms. Mm -hmm. I want them to walk away empowered by the Spirit to live live out right those. Um, in what areas of your life do you not intentionally seek the Holy Spirit's input? Um, again, dealing with acceptance, do we just naturally do something because I know, so using, using mine and your relationship, I'm just going to do stuff, Scott, that will make you happy with me. Mm -hmm. Or, Holy Spirit, in this space, in, in the space that Scott has given me responsibility over, what what do you want me to do? You think it's always going to be uh, not intentionally, or it's just not have a bit like. Sometimes I think we habitually do things and we don't think it through. It's just, it's just. I don't think it's an intentional, willful thing. I mean, like, what do you mean? What do you, you're talking about that second question? Yeah, what areas you? Do, I, I think we need to answer both. Okay. Like, where do I intentionally just leave you out? Oh, that's, how, that's how I would I would put it that way. <laughs> I see Scott what you're needs saying. to hear that. I see. Where um, do I intentionally just leave you out? And where do I just um, I'm a doofus and I just didn't in, I didn't include you in how to inter interact with my child when they were going through that. I just went with what I thought and I didn't even seek the the wisdom of the one who made my my little boy or whatever it might be. Yeah. Ooh, I like. Okay. See, I was being gracious. <laughs> I was being nice. But I don't know, you know, but I, yeah. and we do. We need grace and sometimes we just need, you know, uh, you okay. just need a little yeah. a little, little moment here face to face. Eyeball, look at my eyeballs. <laughs> so, so, okay, so you're saying the question, kind of rephrasing the question in this way, in what areas of your life do you intentionally not seek the Holy Spirit? Right. Yeah. Yeah, so there. Where is that? <laughs> Anyone listening? So this brings us into our, our application question. Hopefully to bring bring everything together. Uh, <laughs> my ramblings about the flesh. Um, and he, here's one thing I love that I I took away from yesterday listening to the story of the woman yeah, at the well. Yeah. Is, um, you know, what? I, and I wrote it down because it was so impacting to my brain. But, you know, I just wrote, Jesus meets us in the midst of our messy story to, to heal us or set us free, to, uh, to, sh to show us truth about him, uh, give us hope, all, all those things. Mm -hmm. And, and what, I, what I came away with was the mess that I made of my life is exactly where he met me. Yeah. Yeah. So I can look at it and go, I'm a mess. Or I can look at it and go, all this that I've done actually led me to sit in this well or at this well with mm -hmm. Jesus so he could heal me. How do you, wait, 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 how do you, are, how would you argue against the person who's like, yeah, so God wanted you to go through that so that you can meet Jesus in that space? He, he can meet me wherever I finally meet him, right? Like, okay. like yeah. I know in my yeah. life, I could have stopped at any moment. He was right. always pursuing me. Right. My friend Rob, uh, uh, 
Matt Bynum, our yeah, friend, yeah. Uh, he used to say, rock bottom is wherever you want it to be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he knew right. rock bottom. <laughs> yeah. If anyone defined <laughs> rock bottom, it was him. <laughs> but, but that's why I love it. He was so great at ministering to those yeah. people because he's like, rock bottom is wherever you want it to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. It could be way up here. It could be like me. And under, but I, under, but and, and that's where <laughs> I don't, you know. There's, there's God seeing everything and, and, but him just constantly pursuing. And I mean, I don't know, the woman could have walked away from him and, mm. you know, she, God would have had other, other, another plan. But no, 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 no. what I mean is, is you, you've heard it Well, God allowed you to go through that so that he would get glory is essentially the, the other way to look at it. Yeah. And, and I'm, sometimes he does allow us to go through things. Sure. He's going to get the glory, but not because he needs the glory. So he didn't set up. So, okay. Like my son didn't die. There we go. There we so go. So that God could get the glory, but he's going to get the glory because he's going to win the day. Right. The, but the glory came in, I got Scott. Yeah. And, Do you, and, and I'm, I, it's hard sometimes for me to, because I'm so free in the, the death of my son being yeah. the, the reason that that he set me free, I'm so okay with that, and and I get that pe some people aren't there yet, right? But to give them hope, of there's the, yeah, it's gonna take some time, right? Um, like even her, as much as they were like all like woohoo, mm -hmm. she still had to go back. She had five ex husbands or whatever they were, and then the dude, uh, and then all the people hurt in between. We don't know yeah. how many kids she yeah. may have had, so she had to yeah. walk through relational things, even if it's just like her sister and her cousins and her neighbors. She had to walk through relational issues. Right. But it didn't mean that she wasn't transformed. So we still have to walk through the stuff of life. Um, but like, I'm totally good with, with the story of, you know, I mean, the story of my life that led me to freedom was the death of my son. Right. It also took a year to begin to turn. Right. <laughs> like it was like, he dies in July and it's the next June where my wife leaves me. <laughs> and then it's, and then it's, you know, August when we start getting help. And it's yeah. not until the end of September where, where we see a major well, transformation where we're like, let yep. me tell you about a God who told me everything about myself. <laughs> so it wasn't like, it yeah. was, you know, a year and three months later when it saw its glory moment. But God was getting glory all along the way. Right. Even in my brokenness. No, I think what I'm, I'm kind of just pondering or wrestling through in this, in what you're saying is, do you feel like some people, I guess it's the sovereignty question of, of people want to give God kind of, kind of to avoid or maybe to justify what they've walked through, they have to go somewhere that says God's in the control. Otherwise, yeah. Or are we even uh, bl blame His power? Like, no, well, God's sovereign. I mean, no, no, no. And I mean, he's good, but He's sovereign. And I think it's. I think it can be both. No, what I'm saying is, is I'm I'm assuming the best about the person. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm assuming the best. What belief system would lead someone to go? God has to be in control of this situation because I feel so out of control. Mm -hmm. So he must have had to cause this. I think that's what I'm saying yeah, is I'm, I'm assuming the best in that. Um, there, there's knuckleheads who are just like, God does everything. Um, but in the people who are genuinely wrestling and struggling through, yes, God's sovereign, but he's first relational. Right. Primarily relational. And because he's relational, it means he has allowed things to take place and transpire that are mm -hmm. absolutely against who he is, what his character stands for. Right. But it, it, it's sad. This is incredibly sad, but he would almost rather atrocity happen than puppet people. Right. Which is like a hard thing because he loves them so much. It's like... Yeah, I was involved in Christian ministry. I was doing stuff for the kingdom uh, yeah. and all that yeah. stuff. Uh, but I was, I was so self-absorbed and I believed so wrongly about God and I had yeah. no healing in my heart. And my son gets a birth defect and dies. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like God going, well, I guess the only way to get Scott is to kill his son. 
He, he did right. not do that. Right. Yeah. But birth defects happen, and it's horrible and sad. And, and I, I've even told the story as many times as I've, as I've asked him over the yeah. years, why, did, why didn't you just heal him or bring him back from the dead? Oh, yeah, we um, talked about that. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And his answer, there's no way I'd understand an answer. I so the answer is God. I love you. There's no way I under, you understand that more than me. Uh, but I'm like, and and I've gotten to the place where I'm like, there's I I would imagine there's no answer you could give me that yeah. I could ever fathom or even come close to understanding. But I do understand what was said to me every time in a deeper way. I love you. Yeah, I've in in light of recent events uh, with people that we love deeply, uh, I've coined this phrase uh, because it's the only way I can explain and, and it sums up exactly what you're saying your story, my story but I don't think an answer will ever su suffice the amount of grief and pain that someone walks through right. like it will never an answer as to why will never be sufficient to alleviate the pain an answer never does yeah. that. I, I had a guy one time ask, he said, Scott, what if his answer to you was this guy who was for me and, and yeah. he had the heart of God. Yeah. yeah. So he's just posing. A, yeah. He was, he was getting me to say it. He said, what if God's answer to you was I had to have Josiah die so that I could free you? Yeah. And I said, immediately, I said, well, that's not what my father would do. And he said, Exactly. <laughs> he got you to see. And I was like, exactly. Oh. oh. I, yeah. And he's like, you know the Father's heart. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Then I'm good. Because okay. at, at that point, it was like, heaven was like, he got it. He gets an A. <laughs> <laughs> We are on application questions. Uh, so here's the here's the question. So we either live from, uh, which is intrinsic acceptance and love, or for earned mm -hmm. acceptance and love. In light of that answer, answer these questions. So intrinsic, um, I had someone on my freedom team. I'm not going to give names. <laughs> kind of protect the guilty. I had someone on our freedom team, like, who's been on it for years. Okay? They came up to me and they're like, Andy, you keep using the word intrinsic. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I think I've done from within. It's, it's uh, intrinsic means a value that is not earned. So like dollars, money, mm -hmm. has intrinsic value. Meaning, yeah, art. Art. it's put upon it. It's, right. it's something that in and of itself has not been derived. It is something that is placed on it. Right. Your yeah. kid draws you something yeah. and tells you why, and you're like, that's the greatest piece I will, of art I will ever own. I will frame it. I've had, yeah. So that's what it is, right? It's this intrinsic, I can't earn it. It is bestowed to me by mm -hmm. my, my dad, right? Um, we live either from intrinsic, right? Intrinsic acceptance and love or for, meaning earned Right. Acceptance and love. Now we know the truth. God is an intrinsic God, so he right. he's he gives it. You know, in light of that answer, or in light of that, answer these questions. Okay, what has four looked like in your life? Meaning, you you earn acceptance right. and love, right? So, what does that look like in your life? And then, what was the result of that? Right. Um, and so that that to me is is you know striving for. I would even say ministries that don't fit me. I remember a season where I wanted to be a church planter and and because I saw around me all these really great men, that's how they were getting acceptance was being church planters. And I wanted to be a church planter because I wanted acceptance. So I'm going to church plant, which was just making my wife wither <laughs> like the scene of the witch in Little Mermaid, like their little soul just like, you know. Um, but that's and also... God was so loving to me, he didn't give me that dream. Because it would have killed me. Like, I am, <laughs> I'm not a church preacher. <laughs> you know, I've heard someone say that my type of ministry is, is very uniquely favored, like Luda Fisk. So, <laughs> I'm like, thank you. Uh, you know, and it, it's just recognition. Hey, Nate, who did Nate, 
who did God create Nate to be? Right. Right. And sometimes the answer to my prayer is is him going, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> yeah. That will kill him. Right. <laughs> um, so, anyways, what did that look like in your life? Um, and for me, the result was a wife who was withering, who didn't want to be talking about the church planting mm-hmm. one. So then the next question, what has from looked like in your life? Meaning you this intrinsic acceptance and love that the father gives us. What has from looked like in your life and what was the result of that? Um, and again, for me, it is I've been able to minister so much more freely with how God designed and created me. Right. I know I am a unique flavor. I was actually just talking with our our life group the other day about just the the ways I use words and talk is not <laughs> always the most polished and yet that's who I am that's right. my flavor of ministry and um you know some people are drawn to it and that's why I work in a team <laughs> because some people aren't <laughs> and they go to other team members you know yeah um anyway so what is the result of that just personal freedom <laughs> I'm so yeah. good with who I am, you know? And it doesn't mean, like, I don't have... I actually just had two of my team members confront me on something the other day. And they're like, that was wrong. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and so it's... Yeah, I got to repent to someone. And um, so what was the... You know, basically this freedom in how I minister right. and, and stuff. Do you have any thoughts on those yeah, two I, questions? I think, you know, for the first one... What has four looked like? It was, you know, my, I made myself th- chuckle because I sounded like Trump. Earn, baby, earn. You know, he's like, drill, baby, drill. Earn, earn, earn baby, earn. <laughs> and the funny thing was the result was, you know, performance. Uh, the result was uh, mostly getting pissed when it didn't work out. Can I yeah. say pissed? Well, we're here. Uh, I won't Phil, say it at church. <laughs> Phil said uh, other swear words the other day that I had to bleep out. So. But like, yeah, just like, well, I'm earning it and no one's paying me for what I'm earning and I and I get yeah. mad so then it just it's a vicious cycle yeah. Michael talks about the vicious cycle of rejection yeah it can be like the vicious cycle of needing acceptance is a vicious cycle of, ex- of yeah. rejection yeah uh, it's just I give a a, a type A spin it's, on it it's the empty I'm not rejected I'm just working hard it's uh, well and then the other side of that is the empty bucket syndrome mm-hmm. if someone's feeling rejected it doesn't matter how much you pour into them yeah there's it's always hard. more it's always like more. it's like unforgiveness if I'm yeah. living unforget if I'm living with an unforgiveness mindset whenever they pay me what I say they owe me it's never gonna be enough they need interest them <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, I mean so it'll really, never fit it'll never be enough yeah, yeah. and then um, the the from uh, I mean it's living from just I'm I'm a son and that journey of sonship that I started that day. In September, back in, in 2003, uh, has just changed everything. And so I have, what I find is I have peace when it's calm. Yeah. And I have, seems as odd as it is, there's more peace when there's a storm. And I think it's because it's like, you know what? I'm good. If <laughs> if something went wrong and people just didn't like me anymore, I got fired. I, I'm still a son. Yeah. I still have a wife. I yep. still have five kids. Like... Yeah. I, and I'm not going to be like, I don't need anything, God, because that's yeah. a yeah. rejection mindset. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm good oh. because I'm yours. Okay, so here's a real world example of this, okay? So um, for years, and Lacey's shared this about her, her story, how she lived from the a poverty mentality mm-hmm. for, for many years, meaning she would, you know, try to sc- scrape and scrimp and, and save and, right. you know, all of that. And so we're, we've been donor supported since 2013. 2013? When did we go to Ireland? 2011? Uh, yeah. I think. Since a date many moons ago, we've been donor supported. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so God's been working on this, this poverty heart of hers. And, and it goes back to the father. Is, does the father have enough? Does the father <laughs> care? Does the father, mm-hmm. you know, is he trustworthy, faithful, all of that? So recently we were in a ministry uh, scenario where we told someone who, who was giving uh, fi- $1,500 a month. And it got to a point in, in ministering to them, we're like, y- you're done giving to us. Like, you think it's contractual mm-hmm. that we do this, so you do this. That's not how it works. So you're done. We, we, if, even if you write checks to us, we will no longer accept those checks. Um, we will not cash them. We could only be that confident, Scott, 
in those moments where you have to confront a hard thing, right? If I worried about, oh, is God going to accept me? Will he care for me? Mm -hmm. Will he care for my family? Will he care for, will he feed my girls? Will he, right? right? If I had this question as to who my father was, some of those hard things in ministry that you have to confront people on, you're not going to do it. Right. Um, and this is why Jesus was fully okay confronting people in his life because he knew he was accepted by the father. Right. Now, it leads to both grace and compassion and, and love for sure. people, but it also leads to some really hard words that likely could cost you financially or even a job. Mm -hmm. But if your confidence, your acceptance, your identity, knowing you're loved, come from the Father and is secure, you can do those hard things a lot, right. a lot easier. Exactly to your right. point, it, 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 those storms mm -hmm. are a lot easier to weather. And then sometimes it, it comes out in my medical stuff. I had... I was I was declared dead by the <laughs> by the government which means all of my all of my insurance all of my prescriptions um, and these aren't prescriptions that are like over the counter 5 bucks I have two specific ones that are over $37,000 a month right like if those go away I'm like oh! <laughs> you know and so it's moments like that where the, the I was dead to the government and it's like okay god I'm excited to see how you, you work this through. <laughs> you better work it through. No, it, it was actually one of those right. I look back on where I'm like, I, I succeeded. In how, yeah. I had like zero doubts, like through the whole thing. Yeah. I think with, with <laughs> mine, when I, when, as I've lived from, that's one of the reasons we talked about well, a few weeks ago, how do we, what character of Jesus do we have or whatever? Yeah. Uh, I think that's why I have high hope. Oh yeah. That's right. Uh, yeah, Cause yeah. I'm like, yeah. it, it'll be, and it's not like a say la vie. It'll be good. It'll no. work out. Que sera, sera. It's, uh, it's like I'm good, yeah. and it's gonna work out because he always takes care of the situation. Yeah, if we allow him to. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing: by take care of it, it doesn't mean he defines him taking care of it by Scott's definition. Right. That's the hard part, right? That's yeah. I think where the release comes in. Going with with medical, right? Mm -hmm. uh, God, I believe you're gonna take care of this, which doesn't mean, oh, so you will heal me. Period. Right. And that was one of the things as I was going, oh, God, you got this. It, my prayer was, hey, if you want to heal me, I know you'll heal me. And if you want to give me insurance back, I know you'll give me insurance back. And if you want me to take meds and see doctors, I know you'll provide the way for that. It was a release of everything. Mm -hmm. it, I was not holding on to any definition as to how he would he would fulfill it. But it's it's that yeah. it's that release. So here's the action. Nope. One more question. <laughs> act, uh, application question is then. So these were all self focused. Okay. This last question is others focused. Mm -hmm. um, how do you encourage from in the lives of those with whom you have a relationship? So what that means is how do you encourage the belief and mindset that they are already accepted they are already loved and so how do you encourage them to walk in living from acceptance right. not earning right. right so that's the question is how do you how do you encourage them to do that and uh, oh we had a great one in our life group they're like you you just model it you just do it oh no, no that was this morning at staff meeting yeah no it was just he's like you just do it you model fromness mm -hmm. which that's how disciples are made when right. i model fromness People are like, oh, you can you can have peace in that situation. Right. How? Especially if they see us and they're like, how are they not freaking out? How are they not? <laughs> and it's like, ah, yeah, I I would have the same question if I didn't know. <laughs> oh, I know who you I were am, there in Jesus. Too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's that discipleship <laughs> question. How do you encourage others to walk in fromness? I like fromness. I know, and I like withness too. I learned that one in or in. Ooh. The withness of God. Hold on, I'm writing down forness or fromness. Fromness. We're just making up words. <laughs> Liv Livism, fromness, withness. Would forness have an e in it? Like no, four. I don't think so. Okay, I'm not putting it in. Forness or fromness. Um, activation steps. Read through the identity guide. Where's uh, that? Uh, you can Is click that in the description. I will attach the right, the right here, down there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I always see people in podcasts like point to things, and it makes sense because you're watching it on the actual app, right? Right. But as I'm doing it, when there's nothing here, it's like. 
It's in this part right here. What do my hands do? <laughs> so, anyways, uh, Bobby. Hey, read through the identity guide. And then the first step to that is highlight one characteristic you resonate with and is easy for you to accept. What's the thing that you're just like, oh, yes. Like you, you So agree. this identity guide, if no one's ever looked at it, yeah. just it has a, lists a yeah, bunch of you, things. On the, on the back, it has a list of scriptural uh, characteristics of how God designed you to live. So it's not his identity. As much, it's your identity. It is my intrinsic identity. It is, it is how, what God has bestowed upon me. Okay. Um, highlight one characteristic, one characteristic you resonate with and is easy for you to accept. Just Why? It. Why? It feels so good. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good. He, there's, there's a lot that I, I'm learning. He's a joyful, happy God. Do you remember when I would always do negative questions? Yeah. You, there's like three. And sometimes they, if they'll set you up for them, you do it that now to set you up for the positive. But yeah, so, so, I think it was like three weeks ago. You're like, these are all negative. I'm like, oh, I should probably do positive. We should all be wearing black and uh, singing mournful songs. <laughs> dirge. <laughs> if you're not listening to dirge music while you're listening. Well, that's a horrible podcast. hymn. To lead us um, uh, it reminds me of, uh, do you remember... Uh, <laughs> Monty Python and the Search for the Holy Grail. I know, the monks I, that yeah, are. I've never seen any Monty Pythons in my whole life. I know. Not one. I, I know references of them. I've never watched one in my whole life. It's a weird thing. You would think I would like own them all. <laughs> it's strange. Well, this has been a fun podcast series. It's too bad that it's come to an end. Scott got fired that week. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know anything. Oh, my God. I, I know references from what I remember. Virging. Well, anyways, uh, so part two of that. Uh, and you'll, amidst all of our talking, just scroll down to the bottom. You'll see this clearly laid out. Um, part two, uh, ask the, uh, let's see here, highlight one characteristic that's difficult um, for you to believe and accept. So you have one that you accept immediately, and then mm -hmm. what's one where you're like, I, yeah. I'm not feeling that. Right. Um, so then, under that one, ask the Holy Spirit what lie you believe instead of that truth. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so maybe it says... Um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm chosen in him. Mm -hmm. I don't feel chosen. So what is the lie that you're believing? Well, I'm not important enough to be chosen. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Not important. Um, so then the, the um, next kind of sub activation step from that is ask the Holy Spirit when you first felt that lie. So if it's the truth is, you know, you're chosen by God. Well, I'm not important enough to be chosen. When's the first time you didn't feel important? Mm -hmm. And then write, write that down. And uh, doing this in prayer. Um, and then finally, work through the freedom booklet to resolve that lie and receive the truth that Jesus has for you in that. Mm -hmm. So if the scenario was, so, real, I mean, these are actually real wor world ones for me. Uh, I'm not chosen because I'm not important enough. The first time I didn't feel important enough was when I was in the hospital and my dad didn't come visit me in the hospital, even though he was visiting currently other people that were in the hospital from his church. <laughs> Pop into second floor where Nate's at. Um, anyway, so that one, that's one that I had to walk through. And so use a freedom booklet for you know who the offender was what the situation was and then walk through that and we'll do a link in our in the description with that with videos and it has yeah. tutorials on how to do that um so yeah good this is good this is good all right uh goodbye <laughs>